Amen. Pray with me as we begin this session. Father God, we thank you so much for your love, for your grace, for stories like the story of Joseph that can bring us uh, lessons uh, in fidelity and courage to know that we don't have the corner on the market on suffering, but we can see how you use suffering to actually build us. And so, Lord, today as we spend our time, may it be profitable for the building up of our own spiritual growth and the building up of your kingdom. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's jump right into session three. Um, see if I can share this screen without messing up. All right, can you see Wisdom Series Part 3? Following God when you feel like He has abandoned you. Don't know if you've ever felt like God's abandoned you or not, but I certainly have. Joseph's right choice, as we just saw in the last session, put him into prison. And I can imagine him asking more than once, what's the deal, God? Is this how you reward faithfulness? And that's exactly what the devil wants us to ask. Because he wants us to distrust, to mistrust God, and to begin blaming God for the bad things that happen. Now, I don't believe God causes bad things to happen to us. But what I do believe is that God can take the bad things that do happen to us, and he causes us to learn how to grow through those. He uses those for our own growth. And I think that's an important distinction. I think it's important for us to understand that God doesn't, uh, God doesn't cause those bad things to happen. But maybe you've been there, like we talked about in the last session. You do the right thing, and it blows up in your face. And our tendency is to shout three words at God. Any, any guesses of three words? You can throw them in the chat. What do you think they are? Well, I'll help you out. It's not fair. Now, I'm sure none of you have ever used those words. I'm sure none of you have ever resorted to that. It's, it's like, yeah, what did I do wrong, God? It's not fair. Why do I have to suffer? Now, we touched on this in the last session, but we often look at biblical characters and we marvel at how their great faith got them through their trials and helped them face some great thing. But I don't want us to miss this point too easily, so I'm going to come back around. We often forget it was their faith that got them into those crises in the first place. They were simply trying to live their life for God. Think Joseph here. Think Daniel, the lion's den. Think the three Hebrews, the fiery furnace. Think Peter in prison. We talked about that. It was their faith that got them into the crisis. It was their God that got them out. And so sometimes doing the right thing in an evil world will cause bad things to happen. And such is the case with Joseph right here. I can imagine Joseph probably didn't go to prison with a positive attitude. I mean, we like to, we like to deify him, kind of like he always had a positive attitude. But I think Joseph was human like us. And we saw in, in the Patriarchs and Prophets last night where he says he had this time of, of uh, depression and terror and what's going to happen to me. So he had those same feelings that we have. I don't think he went to prison saying, oh, joy, I'm so privileged to get to go to prison. He was human. And, and here's what I want to stress here. Just because you don't have the perfect reaction whenever trials come doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. That, that's got to give you some hope right there. But as that heavy jail door slams shut behind him, Joseph had to have felt abandoned by God. Now, Ellen White wrote a book called Eternity Past. It's not one that you hear a bunch about. It was a devotional book, Eternity Past. But notice what Ellen says about Joseph here. She said, Joseph suffered for his integrity. His tempter revenged, his tempter revenged herself by causing him to be thrust into prison. Had Potiphar believed his wife's charge against Joseph, the young Hebrew would have lost his life. So there it is. He would have been killed. But Potiphar didn't believe him. The modesty and uprightness that had characterized his conduct were proof of his innocence. 
Yet to save the reputation of his master's house, he was abandoned to disgrace and bondage. She goes on. At first, Joseph was treated with great severity by his jailers. The psalmist says, his feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in chains of iron until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tried him. Which leads me to this. Ever felt abandoned by God yourself? Like he was being silent? Like you just couldn't catch a break? Like you're blocked, you're ousted, cast aside. All of it feels like abandonment. But what if it isn't an event you can point to? What if you just wake up and find yourself feeling like you've been abandoned by God? Like your prayers bounce off the ceiling and right back down at you. Like there's nothing greater than what you can see. What then? I'm sure you've heard of Mother Teresa. In fact, it was found in her personal writings after she had passed that she wrote that she had felt a dark night of the soul where she did not sense God's presence. Not for one year, two years, three years. She said for 50 years. She felt like God had abandoned her. 50 years that God was silent in her life. And once when she was speaking on the topic, someone asked her how she dealt with such times in her own life. And she's quoted as saying, I simply go back to the last time I know I heard his voice. And I cling to that and seek to be obedient to that calling. He called me to work with the poor of Calcutta. And that's the last I heard from him. Wow. 50 years. I don't know if I can hang on that long. But that's exactly what Joseph came back to. He finally came back to his resolution to be faithful to God. And notice what Ellen has to say again from eternity past. She says this, But Joseph's real character shone even in the dungeon. His years of faithful service had been most cruelly repaid, yet this did not render him morose or distrustful. He had peace and trusted his case with God. He did not brood upon his own wrongs, but forgot his sorrow in trying to lighten the sorrows of others. Wow. She goes on. He found a work to do. Even in the prison, God was preparing him in the school of affliction for greater usefulness. Know that when you get caught in the affliction, God is preparing you in the school of affliction for greater usefulness. And he did not refuse the needful discipline. He learned lessons of justice, sympathy, mercy that prepared him to exercise a power with wisdom and compassion. Are you ready for a mental health tip? When you feel abandoned by God, lean into him all the more and trust that God has a plan that he's working out for your life. I'm going to let that sit in. Just settle with that for a minute. When you feel abandoned by God, lean into him all the more and trust that God has a plan he's working out for your life. Note that Joseph had to get past being unfairly treated. But he did not let that define him. He took stock of where he was and what there was to do at hand. Notice this line and apply it if you feel you've been abandoned by God. I like this one. He did not brood upon his own wrongs, the things that have been done to him, but forgot his sorrow in trying to lighten the load, the sorrows of others. He found a work to do even in prison. One of the worst things you can do when you feel abandoned is to sit and brood over it. To sit and continually rehearse how you got there. Understand, life is unfair. Never has been fair, never will be fair. It will always be unfair because as long as the devil is here, he's going to make sure there's not fairness. And yet... We long for fairness. Understand that God put that longing for fairness within us, but the only time we're going to find that fulfilled is when we get to the kingdom. That's when he makes everything right. 
So that longing for fairness is legit. But understand that as long as we're on this planet, life will be unfair. And the devil will play every card to get you to turn back inward into yourself because you can't look at yourself and look up to God at the same time. Here's an experiment. Now, look directly at the ceiling. Look up at the ceiling, right where you are, wherever you are. Look at the ceiling. Tilt your head back, crank it, look at the ceiling. Now, without moving your head, I want you to look at your toes. Without moving your head, Betsa. Without moving your head, look at your toes. Impossible to do. You can't look at God and all of your problems at the same time. You've got to release one or the other. The problem is most of us release God and we look at our problems. We try to look at God and our problems. We try to, to look at the ceiling in our toes. And, and some of you guys tried this a little bit ago, even though your screens are not on. I know you tried this. You were looking out there and you were trying to get your feet out as far as you could get them, right? Just to see if you could actually see your toes. You cranked your legs way back while you were looking at the ceiling, trying to look. It still makes it hard. You can't look at yourself and look up to God at the same time. Begin to look outward. See the hurting people around you. Seek to meet their needs, and the dark mood will begin to lift. Know that though you don't feel God there, He is with you. God may be preparing you in the school of affliction for greater usefulness. Let that, let's go on. Genesis 39, 21 says this. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Notice who did it. Was it Joseph? No. It was the Lord blessing Joseph. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners. And over everything that happened in the prison, the warden had no more worries, just like Potiphar didn't have any more worries except what to eat, because Joseph took care of everything. Wouldn't you like that to be said of you? The people you work for have no more worries because God blesses you so much. They go, man, it's awesome to have them in my employ. The Lord was with him and caused him everything he did to succeed. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. Now note this, we tend to value success over faithfulness. Joseph was faithful and God made him successful. God has never called you to be successful. He's only called you to be faithful. He's never called you to be that great success that you imagine. He's called you to be that great faithful person and let him make you the success he wants you to be. And here's the formula right here in this story. You be faithful, God will make you successful. It's not about you, it's about Him. It's about His glory. It's not about how great and how high you can rise. It's about how great and how much He can rise, He can raise you up. See, Joseph's life wasn't driven by circumstances. It was driven by principles. Principles based on a key resolution that he was going to honor God no matter what. Perhaps Joseph turned it around and asked, Has God ever felt abandoned by me? So after adjusting to his new surroundings and re-choosing to trust God again, Joseph once again began to find favor, this time with the warden. And soon he was running the prison. Let's go on. By the way, never look down on the circumstances where God has placed you to lead. You know, sometimes we, we want to lead thousands. But sometimes God just gives us two people. Whether just two people, or 32, or 2,000 people, just be faithful where God has placed you and learn the leadership lessons He has for you right there. Do it prayerfully, do it faithfully, because you never know the next stop God has for you. Joseph was faithful with the small things in the dungeon. And the warden began to expand that. And God stepped in, as you know in the story later, and expanded it more. Often... We stand staring into the bleakness. 
And as we stand staring into the bleakness, we fail to realize that what we're actually looking into is God's workshop, where He accomplishes His best work in us. It's there in the bleakness that He builds us for what lies ahead in our lives. It's there in the, in the bleakness that He builds patience into our lives. It's there as we, we stare at the seemingly, I don't know where God is, that endurance takes root and grows. It's there that we become less demanding, more caring. You can watch for those traits later in the life of Joseph and in yourself. If you find yourself in a dungeon of doubts or a, a prison of self-pity or even in the darkness of depression or despair, God is working even now. Is that easy? No. Important and valuable? Absolutely. Now, we don't know exactly how many years Joseph spent in prison. But the Bible does give us a bit of a timeline. We know that Joseph was 17 when he was sold by his brothers. Genesis 37.2 tells us that. We also know that he was 30 when he was appointed second in command of all of Egypt. Genesis 41.46 tells us that. So we know that it was 13 years between being sold as a slave and becoming a ruler. We got that timeline. Some of that time we know he worked for Potiphar, and the rest of that time he was in prison. We don't know exactly how long it was before Mrs. Potiphar did her thing. But in studying through for this series, I found that many Jewish scholars believe that Joseph probably spent about 12 of the 13 years in prison for doing something he didn't do. They say he had only worked for Potiphar for about a year before Mrs. Potiphar pulled her shenanigans and had him thrown into prison. So they concluded he 12 years in prison for something he didn't do. Talk about unfair. Talk about unwarranted. Talk about not being the way it should be. Twelve years in prison when you're innocent. But if so, then this next part of the story would have happened sometime during year nine. Again, we don't know exactly when in the timeline this happened, but at some point during his prison stay, the Bible says that a couple of high-profile prisoners joined Joseph in the dungeon. It was the Pharaoh's chief baker and his chief cupbearer. And the Bible says they remained in prison for quite some time, and then both of them had dreams the same night. Coincidence? No. When Joseph saw them the next day, he noticed they both had very anxious-filled faces, very worried looks. And his compassionate self said, hey, what's going on, guys? He, he wanted to know what was causing the anxiety. And they told him they both had dreams and didn't know what they meant. Joseph pointed them, first of all, to God, who was the interpreter of dreams. And then he asked them to tell him the dreams. They did. And then he told them that one, the cupbearer, would be restored and the other one said, oh, well, here's my dream. Tell me what it means. And he said, I hate to tell you this, but in three days, you're going to be impaled on a pole. So let's pick up the story in Scripture, shall we? Genesis 40, verse 20. Pharaoh's birthday came three days later. And he prepared a banquet for all his officials and staff. He summoned his chief cupbearer and chief baker to join the other officials. They got out of jail. He then restored the chief cupbearer to his former position so he could again hand Pharaoh his cup. But Pharaoh impaled the chief baker just as Joseph had predicted when he interpreted his dream. Pharaoh's chief cupbearer, however, forgot all about Joseph, never giving him another thought. Joseph had said, hey, remember me when you get that. When you get there, remember me to Pharaoh. Tell him about my story. Tell him I'm unfairly here. Tell him I've been here like, you know, 10 years already. But did you catch that? He forgot about Joseph, never giving him another thought. That's, that's pretty harsh. I'm sorry. That's harsh. Nothing worse than people who promise you something only leave your presence and never give you another thought. The next verse is one of the saddest to me in Scripture. Genesis 41.1 starts with three words in the NIV. It says, two years passed. The NLT 
has four words. It says two full years later. Let's not rush past that, okay? Two years passed. Now we can read that in a half a second. We can read it took two years that fast. But that's a long time to be forgotten. That's a long time to continue to rot in jail. Two years passed. We haven't even been a full year into COVID yet. But imagine another year of COVID just like the last. Only without the hope of a vaccine and perhaps another 500,000 people dying. And we read the headline, a million people dead. And unfortunately, we read the headlines like we read scripture. Unless it affects us personally, we just move on. We can read one million people died just as quickly as we read two years past. So don't miss that. Two more years of sitting forgotten in Pharaoh's prison. Two more years to doubt that God was with him. Two more years passing without any hope of getting out. There was no hope of a vaccine on the horizon. It was just more day after day, unending day of the same thing every day. Two years like that. It had to seem like an eternity. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like to wait. I don't like to wait in Atlanta traffic. I don't like to wait in the Walmart line. Especially those people that have more than 15 things in their basket. When I don't, you know who you are. Those people that you see them going towards that, that, that 15 or less thing, and you're looking at your basket, you got three things, four things in there, and you're trying to maneuver ahead of them, but be polite at the same time. Wow, they got a crammed, I guess what they say in North Georgia is buggy, and it's full to the top. We don't like to wait. But the, what's worse than waiting is waiting without any hope of relief. That has to be the worst. No hope of rescue. So Joseph did what he always did. He resolved to honor God right in the middle of the mess. Right where he was. No more pining. No use for pining. No use hoping to be sprung. He knew that he had to get up and be faithful today. And today. And today. And day after day after day, all he knew was, I have to be faithful today. There's no hope on the horizon. There's nobody coming to rescue me. It's just today, another day in the dungeon. Joseph was forgotten by everyone except God. So you and I can find courage as we wait. We can find renewed strength and patience by learning to wait on God, even when we feel like we're forgotten. Because what God is calling you to do is to be faithful today. You can't live tomorrow yet. You can't go back and relive yesterday. All you can to do is choose to live today faithfully. So Joseph is living today, and this particular day, the palace guards show up looking for Joseph. They probably already knew who they were looking for, for they had most likely interacted with him as he was head of Potiphar's household. Remember, Potiphar was head of the guards? And so they snatch him out of the prison. He's rushed across to a place where he is stripped and bathed and shaved and prepared to go in to see Pharaoh. And you probably remember the story, but Pharaoh had had a couple of bad dreams that he couldn't figure out, and suddenly the cupbearer remembers. So Joseph is brought in, and Pharaoh begins to tell him this dream. There were seven fat cows, seven skinny cows. The skinny cows came out of the river and ate the fat cows, but the, they were still skinny. Seven fat heads of grain, seven skinny ones. The skinny ones eat the fat ones, and they're still skinny. Talk about bizarre dreams. You'd think 
Pharaoh may have had too much pizza the night before. You know, that does stuff to you. But Pharaoh had consulted with all of his counselors, and none of them knew the interpretation. And then the cupbearer goes, oh, hey, listen, I was supposed to tell you about this guy. You know, a couple of years ago when I was in prison, we had these dreams, okay? And there's this guy in prison that interprets dreams. And Pharaoh says, well, get him out. Bring him here. And so he comes in and says, Joseph, I understand you can interpret dreams. I got a weird one for you. And so Joseph is brought in, told the dreams, asked their interpretation. And the first thing Joseph does is says, I can't interpret dreams. But my God can. He gives credit where credit is due. He doesn't try to make himself look more important, hoping he'll get out of jail. He doesn't know whether he's going back or not at this point. He doesn't know that what's about to happen. All he knows is that God has given him an opportunity. All he knows is that God is, is giving him an opportunity not to advance himself, but to advance his God. How many times do we miss opportunities to advance our God when we're seeking to advance ourselves? And so Joseph, first of all, acknowledges God as the interpreter of dreams. Then God gives him the interpretation. He tells him there's going to be seven fat years. There's going to be seven years of famine. So he goes on to give Pharaoh some unasked for advice. So, dude, here's what I would do, okay? Find somebody, have them build granaries, and during the seven fat years, store all the grain. During the seven years of famine, you can save Egypt. You can sell the grain back out, and, you know, all is going to be good. Well, Pharaoh consults with his counselors. Before you know it, Joseph is second overall of Egypt. Not only is that a prison, he has been moved to the front of the line, which is a far more dangerous place to be than being a slave or a prisoner. It sounds nice, but a person of lesser character could misuse this newfound power. Listen to this from Ellen White. From the dungeon, Joseph was exalted to be ruler over all the land of Egypt, a position of high honor, yet beset with peril. One cannot stand upon a lofty height without danger. The tempest leaves unharmed the lowly flower of the valley, while it uproots the stately tree upon the mountaintop. So those who have maintained their integrity and humble life may be dragged down by the temptations that assail worldly success and honor. But Joseph's character bore the test alike of adversity and prosperity. <clears throat> he was a stranger in a heathen land, separated from his kindred, but he fully believed that the divine hand had directed his steps. Wow. She goes on. In his early years, Joseph had consulted duty rather than inclination. And the integrity, the simple trust, the noble nature of the youth bore fruit in the deeds of man. So when you look at this whole thing, it's easy to see that he was in greater danger by being exalted. One more I want to share with you. The varied circumstances that we meet day by day are designed to test our faithfulness and qualify us for greater trust. Now, remember I said a little while ago, God did not call you to be successful. He only called you to be what? Faithful. The varied circumstances that we meet day by day are designed to test our faithfulness and qualify us for greater trust. By adherence to principle, the mind becomes accustomed to hold the claims of duty above pleasure and inclination. And then she goes on, Minds thus disciplined are not wavering between right and wrong like the reed trembling in the wind. By faithfulness in that which is least, 
They acquire strength to be faithful in greater matters. Joseph's character shone through. I was reading one, one commentary and it said that when Pharaoh exalted someone to be second command, typically a Pharaoh would throw a gigantic banquet in, their, in that person's honor. But beyond that, they would have a receiving line. Now, this receiving line was just not a normal receiving line. It was one that said, you must, as you go through, swear fealty to this person. In other words, you must swear that you will uphold and honor this person, that you will follow their directions, and you do so. If you don't do so, you do so on pain of death. In other words, if you're not going to be committed to this person and serving this person that I've put in place, you're not worth me having which got my sanctified imagination running, okay? I didn't read this anywhere. I just kind of thought this up. And maybe I'm wrong. But can you imagine a banquet where Joseph is in the seat of honor and everybody has to come by and swear fealty to him? Do you know who would have been there? The captain of the guard, Potiphar, and Mrs. Potiphar. Oh, snap. I can't imagine them in line. No, no, y'all go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll catch up in a minute. Yeah, y'all go ahead. It said that all a Pharaoh had to do if he wanted to, to put someone, you know, to, to kill someone, is he had to just wiggle his finger a certain way. I don't know what the sign was, you know, maybe a sideways or, I don't know. All Joseph would have had to do when Potiphar and Mrs. Potiphar showed up is wiggle his finger a certain way, and nobody asks questions. They take him out, and they're done. And Pharaoh is, would have said, well, oh, he's the one that did that too? Oh, cool, yeah, God, glad we got rid of him. You don't read anywhere that's in the story. You don't read anywhere that, that, uh, that God, you know, commanded him to take Potiphar or Mrs. Potiphar out. You don't see anywhere where God said, now's your chance for payback. So J Joseph's character is shown through his ability to, to forgive Potiphar and Mrs. Potiphar. And later on, it does describe how he dealt with his brothers that sold him into slavery to start with. He recognized that through his brothers, while they meant it for evil, God had meant it for good and to preserve not only Egypt, but the entire lineage of Abraham. Matter of fact, the Hebrew word there, when he says, you meant it for evil, is a Hebrew word that means you tried to weave it in there for evil. You were trying to weave in evil into the fabric of my life. But God rewove, he meant it, he rewove it into something beautiful that will save all of us. So his character had been developed in the prison. So much so that when Potiphar, Mrs. Potiphar came in, he was able to forgive. When his brothers came, he was able to forgive. Joseph trusted God even when God didn't seem so good. He looked past the current circumstances and he held on to a picture of a loving God that was worth serving. And as a result, God exalted him to a place he never could have dreamed of. And God used him to literally save the world from starvation. To save his family, the lineage of Abraham, from death. Wow, what a God. He had to have felt abandoned. And yet he looked past that to hold on to that picture of a loving God. We're going to break now for our, um, for our discussion, our Slido. And uh, quite a few questions that will challenge you. We're going to have about 15, let's see, it's 12, 12, yeah, about 15, uh, 20 minutes or so. We'll just kind of watch the things. And uh, Betts is going to send us now back to groups. So expect that invitation and join the room she's inviting you to, okay? Just hit join when she invites you to join that room. Okay.
So let me share screen again and let's see what you had to say. Got it? So, table discussion here. One person, there we go. Let's, oh, come on, that should go. Had God abandoned Joseph, did he? Do you think there were times when Joseph felt like God had abandoned him? How would you apply that to us? No, God had not abandoned Joseph. God couldn't have, could have been testing his faith. We do think there were times when Joseph wondered what was happening. I'm sure he did. There are times when we feel God has left us when, in fact, he is there. God speaks to us through different ways, prayer especially. God did not abandon Joseph, but I know for a fact that it definitely felt as though God had Joseph, though God had Joseph, although he never did, never left. Uh, no, God was always there. Joseph may have had doubt, but they make us stronger. We can use these doubts to grow our faith. Okay? God didn't abandon Joseph. No, he was with Joseph the whole time. Yes, he probably did feel that way. When we feel like God has abandoned us, we can have faith that he's still there working. Amen. It's probably felt as if God had abandoned him, but he didn't. We just need to have faith. Second question, what is the hardest part for you during those times when you feel God is silent? How do you handle those times? How should you handle them to strengthen your faith? Feeling alone and helpless. Sometimes I handle it well, other times not so well, but should handle it by talking to people, reading your Bible, listening to worship music, taking care of any sin if we are aware of it. Good, good answer. The hardest part is to know when we need to take action versus when we need to sit back and depend on God. It's hard to let God take control instead of me taking control sometimes. Amen. Uh, I, I'm tracking with you on that one. Um, don't quit. Keep pursuing God even if it seems like he's not there with you. Putting more faith in God than we put in ourselves family and loved ones or a support group that can be trustworthy, who are truly dependable. Feeling alone, not know the step, knowing God is behind the scenes helps us grow by bringing faith to them. Feeling alone is the hardest part. I remind myself this will not matter in the long run or to stay faithful. Also remind myself that his silence is not abandonment. Oh, I like that. His silence is not abandonment. That's excellent. Yes. Don't let it go to waste. The silent times can be a testimony in the long run. Exactly. When people see you struggling and see your faith continue strong in God, they'll often come back and say, wow, you have inspired me. You have helped me understand uh, how God is like. And, you know, I remember after my, my father passed away, uh, it was pretty hard for me to be a pastor for a while because how can you minister to the goodness of a God you don't think is so good? And uh, at that point in time, but I had a lot of people afterwards because I chose to remain faithful and, and chose to grow through it rather than just go through it. Um, I had people come to me afterwards saying, you know, you gave me a lot of strength and inspiration watching you and how you processed your, your dad and his death and so forth. And so uh, it was really good to see that uh, I could make it through my issues by watching how you made it through yours. So I thought that was kind of cool. All right, let's go on. How well do you do when people forget their promises to you? What's the hardest part about that? Uh, do you think Joseph may have felt similar? What conclusions do you think he came to? Um, low expectations so it doesn't bother us as much, so lower your expectations. Also remembering that we have done the same to others before. The hardest part is the disappointment. It sure is. Uh, do you think Joseph felt similar? We do think Joseph felt similar, but that he had hope in God. Uh, and we can too. I feel so bad and it hurts uh, so much. But one thing that I remember is that God is always there for me. Most definitely, I believe that Joseph felt like God had given up on him and broken his promises. While in actuality, God was working things out behind closed doors to set Joseph up with his best possible life. And you can be assured that he's doing the same thing for you. Assuming the worst before stuff happens. Oh man, I do that all the time. Joseph probably felt a real connection and wondered what happened. He probably had doubts and wondered what happened, but he still had the heart to help and see where God wanted to use him. It'll be hard. I get angry and frustrated. You wonder how they could forget. Sometimes indifference because we may be used to people letting us down. He probably felt similar, but we think he realized we can always trust in God, even when we can't trust in humans. Uh, we feel disappointed. We often feel rejected. Uh, good answers. Um, and I think that's the last one. 
So I hope that this has been uh, at least a, a helpful to your, to your journey. And so just wanted to take about uh, three or four minutes here and let you respond, uh, if you feel so led, to out loud of something that you're taking away from Connect this year. Something that uh, has inspired you, something that maybe a lesson learned, or something that occurred to you that's never occurred to you before, or wow, that's a, hmm, never thought of that. Uh, but something that, that, that grabbed you, uh, that you want to just share, and if you want to share that now, you can either unmute yourself and say it, or just put it in the chat, either way. We can't look at our at God and our problems at the same time. Uh, yeah, excellent. Somebody else, what did you learn today that you can take with you on your faith journey? Nobody learned anything. That's good. All right. <laughs> Man. Um, I'll just say it out loud. All right. Life as we know it will never be the same again, never. And I believe that God is allowing us to go through these hard times to prepare our hearts and our minds to focus on, on others and not so much on ourselves. Mm. I, I believe as a church, he's allowing us an opportunity to, to come out of our SDA shells and just seek the Lord every day to see where he wants us to go and leave his his presence and his his blessings for others that don't know what we know and it's not about what we know if we don't live what we know mm -hmm. if we don't put it put it into action excellent thank you Emily okay uh, God's silence is not abandoned and Chris Magaka put in the in the chat facts, Mama Emily. <laughs> I see it. I see it. Uh, Jazz says to have faith and pray more in every situation. Also, to still rejoice through my trials because my trials become testimonies later. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't know about you, but every time I study the story of Joseph, I come away with new things. Mm -hmm. Chris says I learned true faithfulness and staying connected to God despite the circumstances mm -hmm. to the very end. Excellent, Chris. Good stuff. When, when we don't speak, that's when God is silent. Sometimes God is not silent. We're just not listening. Right. He's never silent. <laughs> um, and somebody, somebody said to me, if God seems like far away, like he's far away, um, guess who moved? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Mm-hmm. Well, guys, I've enjoyed spending last night and this morning with you. I'm looking forward to, to some great time in August. I'm going to be coming around, hopefully, uh, to visit in person this year, but we're still working on that. Um, and, and they're wanting me to be vaccinated and stuff before I go or, or at least have the COVID thing numbers way down. So if I can't, I'll, I'll be contacting you ACF presidents in the next uh, week or so. Mm -hmm. oh, I like that, Michelle. Never let a crisis go to waste. I like mm -hmm. that. My mm -hmm. Advent House Chris. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, I heard it from someone else. So <laughs> you all borrow where you can. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's a, that's one of the pastor's first rules. Borrow where <laughs> you can. Um, anyway, I'll be I'll be trying to get around and see each of you. Um, and uh, we'll try to uh, set up a schedule. If, if we can't do it in, in person, then uh, I will be definitely visiting each chapter via Zoom again like we did last year. Um, tomorrow night, I don't know if you have it on your calendars, but at 6.30, uh, for those that are interested, there's a Zoom training event that we've been postponing. It actually landed tomorrow night at 6.30. How to attract people to your meetings that aren't like you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's tomorrow night at 630. So same link as what you have today. All right. So you can pass that around. Um, and for those of you who are who are leaders, uh, that's our that's our leadership thing. But anybody can feel free to come and um, and join in on that tomorrow night. Same link, 630. Same thing. Uh, Chris Magaka, you've got something to say about uh, Georgia State and Georgia Tech. Talk to us. Yeah. So um. 
Georgia Tech, they were inspired to initiate a movie night. Uh, we collaborated with them at Georgia Tech as well. So it'll be next Saturday, March 6th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, actually, 7 p.m., sorry, that's when doors open. Uh, it will be an AMC Phillips Plaza. So if you're in the Atlanta metro area, uh, I think even Kennesaw, you can still come down, uh, definitely come through. Uh, masks are required. So I know people are thinking about uh, the COVID-19 restrictions. So masks are there. There is a limit capacity. Uh, if Shelby or Praise, uh, if you could just drop the link for those maybe who wants to um, register, uh, definitely do so. But it is a movie night. We will be watching The Prince of Egypt. Uh, it's a nice and safe um, <laughs> movie for sure. Uh, yeah, but again, next Saturday at 7 p.m. Uh, at Phillips and Plaza AMC. And if you want more information, you can reach out to Georgia Tech, um, ACM group, or you can reach out to Georgia State. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Emily, what are you meaning by information for Atlanta? Um, just so Beth is clear. Send contact info of Atlanta chapters. Uh, the Just the chapter... The leaders? president, yeah, the leaders. Okay, yeah. okay. I try to attend their events, but they're all of their leaders aren't there all the time. But Perfect. if I if I know who I need to be in contact with. By the way, I I wanted you guys to know before we left, I bragged on you. Uh, Wednesday we had our conference executive committee, hmm. and I had to do a report. And so what I wanted to share with them was, ACF not only is not dead, not only just surviving, we're thriving. Amen. And thank you for being attentive to your social media because all I did was snag pictures from your Instagram accounts. Mm -hmm. And I showed them all the different events that you were doing. And that's what uh, Pastor Clark was referring to before he had uh, the prayer uh, was that report that I did uh, on Wednesday. And we have 40 something people on our executive conference executive committee. They're the ones that, that steer ministry for the whole of uh, the Georgia Cumberland Conference. And so um, I just wanted to, to, to add my word to his. You guys are doing a tremendous job. I'm so excited about it. I just got off of North American Division meetings all this week. I sat there all day, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, like eight, nine hours worth of meetings on Zoom. That was just tremendous, let me tell you. Not <laughs> really. But, uh, <laughs> but I will tell you this. Many other chapters around the country have folded uh -oh. because they sat idle during COVID. They said, we can't do anything so. But you guys are still plugging away. Even if you got two or three, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. You're still plugging away. That's and right. The fact that you put stuff on Instagram, I just, I snagged probably 25 or 30 pictures off of different Instagram feeds from our chapters and showed them uh, what was going on and man the executive committee was just thrilled so kudos to you thank you for being who you are for standing firm in the middle of all this mess i am so so happy to to be able to uh to call you guys friends and and fellow leaders and colleagues uh and just so excited to, that we get to work together so um there's a couple other Catherine says emory acf is hosting bible game day next sabbath from two to four okay um, keep an eye on this group me for zoom info. There you go. That's, that's really good. Also, you can, you can get a hold of, uh, Elaine, if you're wondering when the, um, the prayer line is on Friday nights and who's responsible for it. She has actually a little, uh, thing that I keep on my desktop to know who's in, in responsible for it. So thank you guys so much for all you do. For who you are and just being there. And, and Jazz, I, I don't think I've ever met you. Where are you from? I'm sorry I'd call you out in front of people. Yeah. But are you still here, Jazz? Oh, she... Austin, Texas, thank you. Wow. Uh, so are you going to one of the ACF chapters over there? Is that what it is? Uh, with my good friend Justin Yang as the director of ACF over there. So I'm glad that you're here. Uh, I will tell you, people have asked, have we been recording these sessions last night and this morning? Yes, we have. And we will have them up on Vimeo probably sometime tomorrow. So I'll send you guys the link. We'll send it to those that registered. Uh, and then you can share that link with people you think might want to hear these messages. Um, 
and uh, we'll, uh, we'll share them far and wide, and hopefully other people will be encouraged uh, and, and be, um, be strengthened on their way. And yeah, Jess, you see, you see the chat, there, people are glad you're here. So <laughs> come back again uh, to any of our events. We're glad to have you. All right, let's close with a prayer and, um, and then we'll go on our way. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the gift of your Holy Spirit, for the insight that we get from your word, from the story of Joseph that we can relate to. Wow, we've been abandoned. We've been in the pits. We feel like we've been passed over. Sometimes we've gotten hammered for doing the right thing. But Lord, help us to understand that you've never, ever, ever abandoned us, nor will you. Amen. You said, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And so Lord, help us to trust in that even when you seem silent. Even when you feel like you're distant. Help us, Lord, to trust and to hang on. And may we continue to walk with you each day. And may our growth continue to get better and more strengthened. And may we continue to seek to bring others with us. Mm -hmm. And may our lives be a testament to your grace. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Blessings and happy Sabbath, everybody. Those of you that want to come tomorrow night to the training, we'll be on at, uh, at 630.